Good evening. I would like to call our regular council meeting for Tuesday, October 12th, to order at 6 p.m. Um, we have all seven members of council in the chamber this evening. Uh, hello to colleagues. Uh, hello to staff who are here in the council chamber, and also we have staff participating via Zoom. And uh, we have uh, one member of the public in the chamber this evening. Welcome. And um, hello to uh, those watching the live webcast or those watching the recording at a later time. I'd like to uh, acknowledge with respect that we're holding this evening's meeting in the territory of the Wasanish Nations, the Sawat, the Sartlip, the Pakwachin, the Sikkim, and the Malahat Nations. And I would look for a motion to approve our agenda, please, as presented. Move approval. Second. All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. We'll turn to our public participation period, and we have one. Uh, person to speak this evening and uh, we extend a warm welcome to Mr. Ryan Gregory. Mr. Gregory, you are the first member of the public in our council chamber in 18 months. I'm sorry we don't have a prize, but uh, <laughs> you, you do have the microphone for four minutes. Please uh, come forward, uh, press the button for the live mic and uh, the floor is yours for four minutes. Thank you. Sorry, if you just press the mic there, uh, sir. Yeah, you should see a red. Uh... Okay, we may not. Uh, we'll just give you some assistance there. We may not be live. <clears throat> oh, there it goes. Okay. Good evening, honorable members of the council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Ryan Gregory. I was born and raised in Sydney. My family have been members of the community for over 50 years. My wife and I are homeowners in Sydney and small business owners. We have a small residential construction company employing seven people in the community on a full-time basis. I'm here tonight to address concerns surrounding our application for variance on our development proposal read last week at the Committee of the Whole. We want to provide additional information regarding why we have requested the variances, which speaks to the housing needs and current market conditions in Sydney. We care very much about this town's development and addressing the needs of families in our community. The first point I would like to address is concerns about this being a suitable family home or not. A family's life cycle is not just the childhood playing outside years of the home. This time frame may account for the first 10 years of a family's life. The greater portion is the next 15 years of family living where livable space and bathrooms are vital. Two and a half bathrooms allows enough space for a full bathroom shared by the kids, a full bathroom ensuite for the parents, and a half bathroom on the main living level for guests. My brother recently updated and sold his childhood home in Sydney. 25 families viewed this home in the first two days. They all had the same comment. We love the home but cannot get past one bathroom. This home ended up selling to a retired couple that wanted to be closer to town. Moving on to green space and permeability. We do agree that the rear yard patios could be reduced to allow for more green space we are happy to make this adjustment. The pavers we have spec'd are a permeable aqua paver. Additional information on this product is included with the package sent out. Again, playing outside in the yard is describing only one stage of a family's life cycle. This is also a stage where two working parents find themselves pressed for time to attend to yard maintenance. Talista and Iroquois parks are steps away from this property and their amenities are an excellent resource for families of all ages. The variances requested were intended to improve the livability of the home and not to increase profit, as mentioned during the meeting. We consulted with a leading interior space planner to provide a thoughtful layout and use of space with families in mind. Our intention with these homes is to provide an excellent family home with a thoughtful use of space for small lot infill housing, as this is the area of the community available for single family dwellings to be added. I'm not standing here to convince you that this is a home for a young starting family to afford, but no brand new single family homes are. The institution of row housing or multifamily housing would, be, would better address a young starting family's affordability, which this zoning does not permit. These homes are designed for a more mature family that have outgrown their starter home and require more space for their growing family. Currently, Sydney has three single family homes on the market two of which are over two million, 
The third is a 1,600 square foot rancher priced at 999000 In conclusion, our beautiful town is a very desirable place and the only way to tackle housing affordability is by increasing supply, which we'd be achieving by adding two homes where one exists. The current home at 2313 Orchard is not a viable home for a family due to its age and lack of maintenance. I came here tonight because I wanted to clear up some misconceptions, most of all that we had not considered the needs of family, and second, that we are some developers or outside investors only concerned about profit. Sydney is our home and will continue to be. We care about its future as much as this council. Thank you for your time and allowing me to speak. If there's an opportunity for further feedback or questions, I have provided my contact information with the package. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gregory, for uh, coming before, before Council this evening. We appreciate it. Thank you. That uh, will end our public participation period. And just a reminder to members of the public that uh, we do now allow a maximum of five members of the public uh, to attend in person. Uh, but, and you can continue to register to speak to Council uh, via Zoom. And the uh, additional information to register to do that is, is at the top of our agenda on our website. I'll next move to uh, section 5 and we have bylaw number 2218 uh, permissive tax exemption um, uh, to exempt the parking lot on 3rd Street from taxation and I'll turn to staff for an introduction please Good evening, thank, Mr. Hissick. thank you Mr. Mayor so um, this is a bit of housekeeping to take care of the tax exemption for the um, portion of the old fire hall site that the town is leasing back for purposes of public parking. Uh, we knew this was coming when the, um, the site construction was completed and the parking lot was returned to the town for that use. So um, essentially here, we are the holder of the property and if it were not exempted, we'd be paying the taxes on it. So essentially we're exempting ourselves and it's just um, one of those legal quirks that we have to deal with in order to um, not pay more taxes than we collect on it uh, by virtue of more than 50% of the total taxes going to other jurisdictions. So the bylaw is um, for the maximum of 10 years and would have to be renewed for the uh, second half of the initial 20 year term and then again for each of the uh, the renewal terms. The um, statutory advertising for the exemption has been completed and it's uh, in front of council for three readings. Uh, thank you Mr. Hissick. Uh, I'll turn to council if there are any questions uh, before we go to uh, the recommendation. Uh, seeing none we do have a recommendation to give three readings which we would do by uh, three motions if council wishes to proceed. I'll move introduction. Second. Uh, all in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. I'll move second reading. Second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Move third reading. Second. Uh, all in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. And so as indicated in the staff report, uh, notice has been uh, sent out and that will come uh, back to us at a future meeting. Uh, next turn to section six and we have a development variance permit application number DV100294 and development permit application number DP100816, which is at 9805 Seaport Place. The development variance permit application is to reduce the entire interior side yard setback in order to construct a roof over the restaurant patio area. Uh, just before I turn to staff for an introduction, I neglected to indicate at the um, top of the meeting that um, in addition to the three submissions that, uh, so notice was issued uh, from a previous council meeting to residents and we received three submissions which are part of the agenda package and then uh, since the publishing of the agenda on Last Thursday, uh, we've received an additional six submissions, and I would just like to acknowledge uh, the senders of those. Uh, we had a submission from Mr. Uh, Mr. Alan Lane, 
a submission from Mr. Bob Witzel, a submission from Vivian Kleber, a submission from Marjorie Law, a submission from Sylvia Salvini, and a uh, sixth submission from uh, Mr. John uh, McGowan. So Council has received that and reviewed those uh, in advance of tonight's meeting. Uh, I would now like to turn to staff for an introduction of this item, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Ms. Verhagen speaking. Um, yeah, this is a variance application to reduce the interior side setback from the required 3.4 meters to zero meters in order to allow the construction of a roof and enclosure around the existing patio for the restaurant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Verhagen. I'll turn to uh, colleagues on council if they have any questions. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you. So I'm just wondering about these, the last, um, the letters that we received today and whether staff had had a chance to go over them because I'm looking at them and I'm feeling kind of confused that they, they seem to be that this, this isn't approved by their strata plan, but I don't know how or whether that impacts our decision whatsoever. Um, if staff so can I will turn to Mr. That. Humble. Thank you. Yeah, through the mayor. Um, yeah, strata bylaws and regulations um, um, are, are really uh, are not under the purview of the, the municipality. The strata is responsible for, at the end of the day, enforcing their own internal bylaws, not the town. The town focuses purely on its own bylaws and regulations. Uh, so, um, Fundamentally, if strata, strata members have a concern about the enforcement of their strata bylaws, they should take it up with their respective strata council. Again, it's not the responsibility of the municipality. So um, there are times where you'll see conflict between an individual strata bylaws and, uh, and the own uh, municipality's own uh, sort of uh, regulations. So if this is a case, then, then again, it's up to the strata to look at their own um, strata council to enforce. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Mr. Humble. Um, Councillor Rintoul. Uh, thank you, Mayor. A uh, question through to staff with respect to the letter from Mr. Allen Lane dated August 29th. So that's the one that originally came out in the package. Um, Mr. Lane appears to, to point out uh, with respect to process um, a misstep. Uh, however, I'd like that clarified from staff's perspective. Uh, uh, whether or not indeed the process has been followed correctly. So I'll yield to staff's comments. Yes, thank you. Through the mayor to Councillor Rintoul, um, the letter was wondering why there was no request for feedback on the proposed development permit, I, I believe. So the legislation and our bylaws require that we send out a radius mail out when there's a variance being considered for approval. Um, the le provincial legislation does not require any radius mail out for a development permit application. The Town of Sydney land use procedures bylaw does have a radius mail out requirement for a new development permit application, the new DP major in the downtown development permit area, downtown commercial DP area only. So that was done when this application was received. But we do not send out a radius mail out looking for comments or feedback when council is con considering approval of a development permit. Just the variances. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. Um, and some <coughs> questions through you to uh, to staff. Uh, just a follow up on that last question uh, from uh, Councillor Rintoul. Um, I what I gathered from the um, the letters was that there was a concern that the original application that was submitted in March 2020 was different from what has um, evolved now. At the time in March 2020, what was proposed by the applicant was just putting a roof over top of the patio. And it seemed like a fairly, <coughs> fairly straightforward thing. <coughs> Sorry, they weren't... Um, <coughs> planning to enclose, enclose the space. And at the time, it seemed okay to have um, build right up to the lot line because the whole area was, was still gonna be um, open. Um, and what it's evolved to now is um, 
more of like a, an addition. Staff have categorized it as a an addition to the building rather than just covering the patio. So it, it seemed like the, the concern from the letter writers was that yes, the, the notice went out in March, but then the application has changed significantly. So if maybe staff could comment on, is, is that sort of a regular uh, sort of thing that happens in terms of what happens when the initial application is changed? Do we still have to go out again for, for notice or, or not? Sure, through the mayor to Councillor O'Keefe. Um, no, the, we send the notice out when the initial development permit major application is received for those new developments in the downtown commercial DP area. Uh, the bylaw doesn't require that we send a notice out each time the plans are revised. The initial design did have windbreak screens, like windscreens, glass, that extended a ways up the sides of the roof structure. So it was fairly enclosed as well. Thank you. Thank you, and, Ms. Verhagen. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so just one more. And the other thing I, I was um, kind of struggling with in terms of, um, yeah, this has evolved, like I said, from just a patio with a roof. Um, the plan right from the beginning was that it would be open, open sides. Um, when, when I reviewed the, uh, this, the new submission that came in July, and then also um, listened to the architect's presentation at APC um, back in September, it seems clear that the intention is that this is an enclosed space. So it's not just putting a roof over a patio, it's significantly adding an addition to, to the restaurant. And I guess, so my question to staff is, and this is something that came up with APC members, I believe as well, in terms of do we treat, what, what are the implications of this being considered an addition rather than a patio? So there should be implications to parking perhaps, um, whether there's implications for how the occupancy load is calculated for the LCRB. So perhaps if staff could comment a bit on that. Thank you. Sure, through the mayor again to Councillor O'Keefe. It's the same permit process either way, whether it's an addition to a building, to like to a commercial building used as a restaurant or enclosing a patio. It's a development permit major application and then a building permit. So same approval process. Um, it's considered an increased or gross floor area, whether they're enclosing the sides or not. So that's what defines it as being a development permit major rather than minor. Um, they're proposing to add a roof and retractable glass around the space. So we're considering that still a covered enclosed patio. Um, we would not count that as, as seating to count towards their required number of parking spaces based on seating. The business license and associated fees are not impacted by the proposed change. In terms of their LCRB requirements, like their liquor and cannabis board requirements for their liquor license. The patio is already part of their licensed area, so it's unlikely that they'll have to make a change in terms of their servicing area there. If they do, the town's only involvement would be to provide an updated occupant load calculation that the restaurant would then provide to the LCRB to amend their license, but as I said, it's already part of their licensed area, so it's unlikely that they would have to do that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Verhagen. Did you just, wish to continue, yeah, just, Councillor? Yeah, just a follow up. Yeah, I'm I, I, I'm still struggling on uh, classifying it as as a patio. I guess I think my understanding from when we we talked about um, allocation of parking spaces in the context of the Small Gods Brewery um, application, for example, what I recall from staff is that the park uh, the, the patio space is not included in the parking calculation for the um, premises because it's considered temporary space. And so that makes sense. If they're not going to be using it uh, year round, then that's why in the small gods um, situation, the parking was th that uh, those tables in that space wasn't included. Um, but in this case, it is it is clearly the case and they the architect confirmed that in her presentation that this is this is year-round space. So whether you we call it a patio or whether we call it something else, 
I think the, the point of the matter is how is the space being used? And so it seems from my view, if this is to be, um, and staff have characterized it as an extension to the space, um, it's going to be used year round. Um, so in my mind, that's different from a patio that is used just part way. And so it seems to me, we should be looking at the parking requirements. Um, when I looked for a definition of what a patio is, I had an idea what it was in my mind, but according to our zoning bylaw, a patio is something without a roof. So this has a roof. So the definition of patio um, and the way that it's being used um, doesn't seem to, I, I think we should be looking at this as a, um, it's more a permanent stra a structure rather than a, a um, temporary space. So I think we should be taking a look at the parking and whether there's other implications because it is being used uh, long-term rather than seasonally. I'll just leave it at that for now. <clears throat> okay, so I'll, I'll take that as a comment, uh, uh, Councillor O'Keefe, not a question through to staff. Yes, okay. um, I'll turn to Councillor Fallot and then to Councillor Wainwright. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so following up on that, um, I too have some difficulty understanding what it is we were looking at because when I look under our agenda, uh, uh, it says to reduce the interior side yard setback in order to construct a roof over the restaurant patio area. Yet clearly um, we hear from APC that essentially this is an extension to the building and it is being looked at as a permanent structure. So I guess if, if, we, if this had been presented as the restaurant wishes to expand the permanent use of their patio and enclose it within the restaurant, I don't know necessarily if my decision would be different, but it, it is being presented more accurately. There's, there's greater transparency to what is being actually asked for. This is more than a restaurant patio area. So my question to staff is, by leaving the exterior wall between the restaurant and the patio, because I understand that that is the intention, are we using that to define the restaurant to be expanding to include the patio in its permanent space, or is this simply making the patio more usable? Like, is that how leaving that wall between the restaurant and the patio, is that how we're continuing to define this as being a patio? Through the mayor to Councillor Fallett, the fact that they're retaining the the building exterior and just making the openings through to the patio, is, yeah, we are considering this an enclosed patio area. The roof is over it. There's retractable glass around it. I'm just pulling up the zoning by law definition of a patio here. Um, yeah, that is what we were looking at. So that's why staff do take the position that this is an enclosed covered patio area. It's not a structural addition here. Um, the patio definition talks about abutting a dwelling unit. So this is an outdoor, this is a commercial seating area. It's an outdoor patio. So now it will be a covered patio. Okay. Um, I accept that but I will say that it, it, this feels different than what is being presented. To put a roof over a patio and is one thing. To enclose it, put a fixed window on the north side to mitigate sound transference to the residences to be looking at um, an air handler, mechanical unit, whether they hook into the hotel or whether they put something elsewhere, this is starting to look, look and sound much different than simply a roof over a patio. Um, so I'm just gonna leave that part there. Thank you. All right, through the mayor to Councillor Fallot, just to clarify, the plans don't indicate that there's an air handler unit that was discussed at length at the Advisory Planning Commission who did have concerns that if one appeared, then that would be detrimental to the appearance of the, the roof and the structure here. 
Um, but the architect confirmed that that would all be sorted out at the time of building permit. So they haven't said there's an air handler unit or an HVAC equipment going on the roof of this piece. So just to follow up, yes, thank you. Um, I am aware that at this point it's not part of the application. That would be determined later on when they're looking at uh, uh, consulting with the mechanical engineer, etc. So thank you for that, uh, Ms. Verhagen. Thank you, Ms. Verhagen. Thank you, Councillor Fallot. I'll turn to Councillor Wainwright, and then I would like to uh, speak next. Um, thank you, Mayor. So I guess, uh, like, I've been listening to the discussion, and I'm just concerned that... Um, whatever approach we take to this we're consistent with all other patio enclosures throughout sydney and i would not want to rush into this because you know my recollection is that this matches what we've done with other patios um as far as the process aspects of it as well i <laughs> I really, um, I'm having trouble remembering a develop a major development permit that um, has come into the town and did not change through the process. And you know, we would not re-advertise every time there was a change along the way. We do it once to make sure that people are aware of what's going on. And and in fact, ten years ago, we would not have even been advertising a development permit major. This is a change that council made recently to be a lot more transparent. So um, it's working. People are aware of it, <laughs> obviously, because we got you know a fair amount of input on this one. Uh, I'm. I, I guess I just wanted to make those comments that uh, I would be very cautious about um, pulling this out as a special case. And particularly if if we're thinking about, you know, if they put an air handler on the roof, but they're not planning to, then it would make it turn into an addition. Um, maybe we should wait until they actually make a change like that. Uh, at the moment, I'm comfortable with staff telling us that it matches our definition of a patio uh, in our bylaw, and I'm comfortable. <laughs> following the guidance of our bylaws. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I, I would like to uh, uh, concur in that um, I, I, accept, uh, council, or I accept staff's uh, interpretation of the bylaw and, and um, identifying this as continuing as a patio. My question is, is partly arises from, um, from some of the um, written submissions that, uh, that came after the agenda was, uh, was published, and it speaks to the variance setback. And I, I'll, I'll a question through to staff is that um, when this uh, when this development was uh, originally approved, uh, it was a comprehensive development uh, zone, um, and that uh, the patio was of a certain footprint. Um, the patio is remaining the same footprint, uh, but there will be the addition of a roof. Um, can staff please speak to uh, confirm that, and then speak to why this now becomes a variance? Uh, compared to the original development. Yes, the de the patio is going to remain almost exactly the same footprint. There is a portion of the patio in the southeast corner that does extend beyond property line into the town's park parcel of Beacon Park. So that will be removed and pulled back to property line and the structure would come up to property line but not extend beyond in that area there. So you would see a slight change in the area of the patio in the southeast corner. The original patio there was not considered a structure as something that extended into the required setback area, but this roof is a structure and would be something that would need a variance in order to be in that required minimum setback from that lot line. Uh, thank you, Ms. Verhagen. I'll turn to, if there are any other questions, uh, otherwise we could move to uh, recommendations and continue with deliberation. Move the rec. Oh. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe, a further question? Yeah, just, just uh, back to staff again. Um, Ms. Verhagen mentioned th the definition of a patio in the zoning bylaw, and she said something about it abutting to a building, but I'm, I'm quite certain the definition, the first line of it says, a patio does not have a roof. So my question back to staff is, is that the case? Does our zoning bylaw say a patio uh, does not have a roof. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Hagen, are you on sorry, mute by chance? <laughs> yes, sorry, just pulling up the definition of the patio there. Thank you. It does say a structure apart thereof, number one, with no roof or walls except for visual partitions and railings, two, abutting a dwelling unit, three, constructed on piers or on a foundation less than 0.6 meters above the adjacent natural ground level, and four, used as an outdoor living area. So yeah, I mean, the, the definition says with no roof, but also says abutting a dwelling unit. So this is an outdoor seating area for a commercial restaurant use. So we have interpreted the area as a patio. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess my final comment would be, I would, I, I guess I would, before we uh, would make a final decision on this, I think we need to have a bit more clarity and come to common agreement on the interpretation. Um, because I think, yeah, it could affect um, other, other applications in the future. Okay, I have a comment, but I'll turn to Mr. Humble first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, through, through to, to um, the comments from Councillor O'Keefe. So I, I think from a staff perspective, um, and, and um, Ms. Verhagen spoke to this about uh, previous interpretations and how we've interpreted I, I can't recall this particular instance coming up with a commercial property and, and, uh, and uh, um, enclosure of a patio. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, I'm not sure. I, I recall lots of um, patio enclosures associated with residential and um, and certainly in my time uh, with with respect to balcony enclosures with condominiums very very commonplace uh, weren't considered part of the habitable space of a, of a condo dwelling uh, we don't see that so much anymore I think though the time to reflect on you know the interpretation of the zoning bylaw and moving forward would be during a zoning bylaw review. And if there's if there's concerns about the interpretation or how it's being interpreted, I think maybe that's the time to consider it. And uh, I would say it's not, not not now is not the time with respect with respect to this particular application. But uh, if there's a concern about patio enclosures in the future, in particular as it relates to commercial development, uh, that would be the time to look at it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Humble. And I'll, I would concur and was going to speak to part of that what you said. Um, and um, uh, to Councillor O'Keefe, um, you, you've made a comment um, to uh, to take a direction or to take action. We would have to pass a motion uh, to direct staff uh, with regards to this application. So we're looking at taking a decision on approval of the application this evening. Um, so do you have a motion that you wish to bring forward? Well, I guess what I would, uh, oh, sorry. Your mic, sorry. Um, not, not knowing where my, my colleagues are landing on this, um, I, would, I would propose something if, if, if this were not to move, to move forward. And so I'm, I'm just wondering what the best process is, is to, um, whether it would be to, to see if council colleagues are fine with moving forward with the current process. Um, if not, then to have a subsequent motion to refer back to staff. I'm, ju I'm just wondering what the best w route is to go there. Well, that's your decision to take, but um, I think Councillor Rintoul is willing to put forward uh, a motion and oh, okay. uh, I'm willing to, uh, to turn to Councillor Rintoul. Okay, sure. Yeah, perhaps this will help. Okay. I'll move the recommendation that DV application be approved and that the DP application be approved subject to the condition that the exterior design remains unaltered from the plans dated July 7th, 2021. Second. We have it moved and seconded deliberation, Councillor Rintoul. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, my, my comment would be this has been, uh, you know, vetted through the advisory planning commission they were very concerned about the prospect of uh, an hvac mechanical system uh, potentially on the rooftop and that's why this is fairly clear um, at their insistence that the uh, exterior design remains unaltered from the plans dated july 7th 2021 um, with the intent that that possible uh, concern for uh, residents in the building uh, also for the, uh, the aesthetic uh, nature of, of the uh, of the rooftop you know not be changed from those drawings that were submitted so the APC is comfortable with this 
uh, this discussion about is it a, a patio or is it an extension, um, you know, to me in, in our climate, um, you know, a, a patio could potentially be open uh, year round. We certainly saw during COVID the town doing its utmost to assist local businesses to have uh, patio services as an extension to interior services. Um, to me, um, these windows, uh, you know, facing south, facing east, uh, open. They're designed to have that open air. And I think it's frankly just out of respect uh, for the residents uh, that the windows to the north are, are going to be remain closed to help mitigate any noise from the patio. We, we've seen uh, you know, music, uh, live entertainment on that um, that venue before, and so likely uh, it's just a respectful decision um, that that the applicant has has made. So I'm I'm comfortable continuing to support this. The only thing that gave me pause for uh, concern um, was similar to Councillor Duncan's question with respect to the strata bylaws, and and I get that the uh, that the strata is going to have to uh, uh, come to terms with that particular issue, and that uh, and that. Per the CAO, CAO's uh, confirmation, um, the town is not party directly to that process. So I'm comfortable continuing to support this, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fallon. Mr. Mayor, may I? Certainly, uh, Mr. Hagen, go ahead. Sure. May I make a comment? Just in relation to the off street parking and loading bylaw and how we consider changes in commercial use, there is that clause in the parking bylaw that says, notwithstanding any other section of the bylaw, a change from one commercial use to another to another commercial use in an existing building requires no further provision of parking spaces provided that the number of existing spaces on the property at the time of the change in use is maintained so this is still a patio associated with a restaurant outdoor seating to covered seating there's no change in use there so that would not trigger a, a recalculation of parking spaces just i wanted to add that in there thank you thank you mr higgin that's helpful i'll turn to councillor fella thank you um, listening to my colleagues' uh, conversation in regards to uh, this application, not making an example of it, and uh, Mr. Humble's comments about looking at it in future uh, zoning, uh, looking for the definition of a patio, I really would like some greater clarity um, on how we're defining a patio because, um, as I said earlier, I don't know if this necessarily changes how I view it and my end decision, but I think there needs to be some clarity. My definition of a patio would be an open outdoor space. And now what we're enclosing it, it's no longer a patio, it's just, it's a sunroom. And um, I think we just need to define that properly. So I would look forward to having that discussion in the future. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to uh, Councillor Garner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And if it, if I may, can I ask a question of staff that just suddenly bolted in my brain? Please. Um, if 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 it's such the weather dictates that the, with the roof and everything's enclosed in a particular day where all the windows are not are not retracted, um, are they then uh, bound by um, COVID rules in terms of distancing inside the facility? And does that alter their usage for that in that in that occasion? Through the mayor to Councillor Garnet, in terms of whether the current COVID protocols alter the seating capacity, I would have to look into the current provincial health orders on that. I, I can't respond at this time. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Oh, uh, yeah. So I just, f for me, the, the main thing is um, consistency and common understanding, making sure that we're applying a common set of um, rules for these 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 sorts of things and so i i don't have that level of comfort with this in in one respect we're classifying it as an extension um, but then when it comes to parking we're calling it temporary space and so yeah i have trouble with our interpretation um and trouble with um in terms of the parking use i looked at that as 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 well um it's still the same commercial use so the use has, has not changed, but the foot has, footprint has expanded. So in my view, I think we should be looking at that. Um, I don't think that's going to be decided here today, uh, but I think it certainly is something we, we, need, we need to look at because it's, um, um, 
in, in terms of making sure that everybody understands how we're going to interpret these things. It's important for us, it's important for staff, and it's important for um, others in the future who might want to come forward in regards to uh, their patios. So I'll, uh, I'll just leave it at that, thank you. I thank you, Councillor. I appreciate your comments, but I do want to clarify one one part of your comment, and that was with regards to this being um, an, ex an, an expanded footprint. Uh, I think we clarified that uh, the footprint uh, for s the seating area will remain the same. If if staff could could just confirm that again, please. Your story, Councillor. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Verhagen. Sorry, sorry, just so clarify, not, not, I didn't mean like expanding the actual footprint. I'm talking more about the expansion of the use, use of space so that it's no longer, it's no longer a temporary space. So going back to the small gods, the reason staff gave at that time for the parking requirement was that they don't include the patio space because it's temporary space. It's not used year round. So what's different in this case is that it is being used year round. So it contributes to their overall um, sort of expansion in the use of the space available. So that's the, just to clarify my point on that. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question all in favor. Opposed, we have one opposed, Councillor O'Keefe, the motion carries. Thank you. We'll turn to section seven, adoption of minutes. Uh, we have the minutes from our regular council meeting of September 27th. Move adoption. Move adoption of the minutes. Second. Moved and seconded. Any errors or omissions? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motion carries. And we have the minutes from our special council meeting of October the 4th. Move adoption. Second. Moved and seconded. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, I have no mayor's report this evening. We'll turn to council reports and uh, item 11A, uh, Councillor O'Keefe is bringing forward a report uh, this evening which is seeking to establish a tri-municipal that is Saanich Peninsula Advisory Committee on Disability Issues. Um, Councillor O'Keefe, I would ask that you first uh, move your recommendation, have it seconded and then uh, ask you to, um, okay. to speak to that. So I'll move that the proposal to establish a Saanich Peninsula Advisory Committee on Disability Issues be referred to staff to report back to council on the feasibility of a tri-municipal joint committee, governance aspects of the committee, and its potential impact on staff and town resources, and two, that staff provide the report back to council before the end of the first quarter of 2022. Second. Moved and seconded. Councillor O'Keefe. Okay, uh, thank you. So I think the report um, outlines sort of the, the rationale for the committee, um, for this type of committee, and for why a joint committee with North and Central Saanich is proposed. Um, so I'll just provide a bit of background on how this came about, uh, the research that we've done so far, and an update on some recent uh, developments. Um, so this is something that's been worked on for about the last four months. So this included looking at uh, all other similar committees that are already in place within our region um, and, and around the province. Um, there was a small group of uh, people who, who gathered together to take a look at the, the need and viability that included uh, Councillors Fallett and uh, Councillor Gartshore from North Saanich and Councillor Newton from Central Saanich and also community advocates, David Willows and Charlene Froome, and uh, Jennifer Van Eyes, who is from the Shoal Center and who is currently involved in the current uh, Access Awareness Committee. So we drafted a terms of reference and a proposal. Uh, we've had staff uh, take a look at that and our mayors, and all three councils are bringing this to, or all three councillors are bringing this to their council um, this month. So, um, the late breaking news on this is, so after this report was prepared, uh, we found out that it is actually the provincial government's intention to make these committees mandatory for municipalities in 2022. Um, had some communication with the province on this to find out um, 
okay, if you're going to do this, should we just kind of sit back and wait for you to come out with the formal direction? Uh, he encouraged us to keep moving forward. He pointed out that the requirements for these sorts of committees are already included in the new in legislation that was passed in June. Um, he also provided some guidance documents and uh, examples on how to, how to proceed. Um, so I think what would happen next if, if council supports this proposal, um, sort of be handed over to staff to, to contact the, the province to confirm you know, the, the provincial government's uh, direction on this and their guidance in regards to these committees and to make sure that what we're going to be doing is, is we'll sort of align and be in compliance with, uh, with, they, with w where they're going with this. And then sort out, uh, as the uh, recommendation says, the, gov the governance, how a committee would work. I don't think something like this has been done with three municipalities, so there'll be a, a little bit of, of work there uh, for, uh, for Mr. Humble and uh, staff to, to, to figure that out. So I'll just leave it at that, unless anybody has questions or um, if there's anything staff wanted to, to add uh, in, in, in regard to that. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, I'll turn to Council, uh, Councillor Fallon. Thank you. Um, I would just like to um, thank Councillor O'Keefe for steamrolling this one. Um, she's been a great champion to bring this forward. And uh, we had several meetings, and I was, uh, was happy to, to join Councillor Keefe and the other councillors and the individuals um, who had input into this. And, and uh, I would really like to see us move ahead with this um, and see us be uh, slightly ahead of the curve. I think this is uh, something that we could be proud to, to have as a in our bag of, of how we work in a community and um, to be able to refer things to a committee who can give us some input that comes directly from experience and, and knowledge uh, rather than trying to second guess what we need to do. And if it's going to be mandated anyhow, um, yes, we could turn around and say we'll wait until the, the province makes that uh, mandatory and then pick it up. but. Um, I think a lot of the work has been done. I'm not suggesting that um, there isn't more work that staff have to do, but I would like to, I would really like to see our community and the peninsula come out and say that we've joined together and uh, put together this, um, this advisory committee. So many in our community have needs beyond the basic accessibility, and I think we should we should respect that and see how we can make our community more inclusive. And I would like to see our council support this to move it ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fellow. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Yeah, thank you. Um, obviously, I don't disagree with, with point one, and a lot of work has been done, and especially the fact that it's going to be now mandated from the province, so I think just gives me even further reason to say that Point two, I don't think I can support, except for that we could refer it to strategic planning. We have strategic planning in two days, and to say that now they have to coordinate to meet provincial requirements, and that it's going to be a lot of work for the staff, particularly Mr. Humble, and to, to, to actually give them a timeline that we don't know whether staff can meet, particularly if they're having to co coordinate with the province and the other municipalities now, I would much rather give the staff the ability to put that into the strategic planning and give them kind of more of an open deadline on on when they can provide us a report back on what's gone on. Uh, I'll, sorry, I'll turn first time speaker, okay. Councillor Wainwright. I was going to respond to her. Yeah, that's okay. I'll, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mayor. So um, the idea of a, a tri-municipal advisory committee is not something new. And um, I, th I th I think the staff probably have got quite a bit of background information from times this kind of thing's been attempted before. Like we used to have tri-municipal meetings of all three councils and governance issues got raised about that kind of thing and also in the context of advisory committees. So I don't think it's probably quite as much work as maybe we might be thinking. Um, I would agree that um, 
you know, maybe that target is, am uh, and I say maybe is ambitious, but the thing is, if um, if council sets a, a target deadline for staff, and for some reason there are other priorities and it isn't possible to meet it, staff will tell us as we get closer to the target. So I'm okay with it standing, uh, rather than having a, a major debate over um, whether we move this forward or not. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor Keith. Uh, thank you. So um, it, it, this, it was a concern about uh, uh, when we would get to this, and so we did have consultation with staff um, prior to bringing this forward, um, and we wanted to do that before we brought it to our councils because we were afraid that uh, councils would have uh, different priorities or different timelines or or whatever and so that's why there was some consultation with the CAOs in advance of this to say what, what do you think would be doable um, the initial plan was to have it in place for the first quarter um, that would have been nice but it you know um, knowing that is going to be mandated you know staff wanted to have the time to make sure that we are are following the, the rules um, and also as Councillor Wainwright alluded to, there's quite a lot of information already on this. Uh, there's um, guidance, there's a draft terms of reference that's been um, drafted already. So I, th I think that will be okay. I think that the more complicated bit, uh, perhaps for staff, will be figuring out um, how do you manage that tri municipal thing. So, but the indication we got from staff that having a report back by the first quarter was, was doable. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Mr. Humble. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, indeed, um, I, I mean, I, I think it is doable. Um, um, I'm waiting to, uh, I believe it's going to North Saanich and Central Saanich and their respective councils, I believe on the 18th, and uh, so I'm, I'm eager to, uh, to hear from uh, uh, the other CAOs in terms of how that goes. and. Uh, if uh, if it's moved along, certainly we would want to collaborate on uh, on uh, a report together, uh, so that we have uh, uh, similar similar recommendations or reports going to our respective councils. Um, yeah, and and um, there, quite frankly, you know, the governance aspect I think uh, can easily be sorted out. It's the bigger issues or challenges are around um, how we um, share in sort of staffing and resources, you know, uh, with respect to uh, the meetings and, uh, and what that uh, in particular looks like. And, uh, and the other aspects around, um, you know, uh, elements of the terms of reference and, and um, what this particular committee, what they end up looking into if they're starting to delve into our individual bylaws and that sort of thing, that's where we need to be able to coordinate uh, our own resources. All of us have different bylaws <laughs> and different regulations that we're looking at. Obviously, we all follow, you know, um, similar legislation and uh, and the BC Building Code. But still, if we're looking at individual bylaws, that's going to take a bit more coordination. So, uh, I think there's a lot of details to work out, but uh, we'll make best efforts in uh, reporting back by uh, the suggested deadline. Thank you, Mr. Humble. Further discussion. I just want to thank um, uh, Councillor O'Keefe for working collaboratively with, uh, with fellow councillors in North Saanich and Central Saanich uh, to bring this forward. Uh, for Mr. Humble, uh, um, al already speaking, reaching out and speaking with uh, uh, colleague uh, CAOs on the peninsula. And um, remember, this in, in this recommendation is for staff to report back to Council on the feasibility and the governance aspects. It's not to have this committee in place by the, uh, by the first quarter of 2022. Seeing no further discussion, I'll call a question all in favour. None opposed. The motion carries unanimous. Thank you. I'll next turn to uh, Councillor Garnett, uh, who is our liaison to the Memorial Park Society and will provide a verbal update. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just have a brief one. Um, haven't met, we hadn't met since May 27th for various reasons a lot of them COVID related and uh, availability of room space. So we met on the 5th of October and uh, there was an update provided by the um, 
by the board and uh, what they said was the vaccination site at the Mary Winsmere Center was a success and VIA indicated it was one of the best sites in the Victoria area um, in terms of accessibility and the way it was handled and processing people through uh, no complaints worked very well and um, very highly regarded so hopefully we never have to have this again but if we do we know we work well in this community and we'll probably be reached out to again um, and then of course they had the election and they had advanced polling and then they had actual the the day of the election and um, they actually stayed on for a few days after so it was a uh, quite a long stint apparently they were there till two in the morning the day of the election counting ballots so um, because the um, the uh, people that did mail-in ballots, I don't know if people know, but the ballots actually went to Mary Winspear, so they were actually there to be counted. So, uh, And apparently it was it went really well, and they didn't have the huge delays like I saw on TV in places in Toronto. So um, another good shout-out to our uh, Mary Winspear Centre for doing a great job. Um, and both of these things contributed to uh, helping them in their uh, financial bottom line, and they're currently sitting at a $26,000 surplus with... Uh, which is considerably impressive when you consider what everything that's gone on this year in terms of not being able to have their normal their normal venues uh, so but they didn't sit idly by so they secured uh, two grants during this time one from an organization called factor and it was for eighty thousand dollars and it was to work with underrepresented artists uh, LGTB, LGBTQ uh, artists and uh, First Nations artists and, and such and uh, they had musicians come in uh, and it, it tied in with another grant they got, with, which is from the Victoria Foundation for $25,000 in a restart grant and allowed them to buy cameras, which was actually a, a great thing for them because they normally have to rent them and they can cost up to $7,000 to rent. And it cues back into the underrepresented groups because it gives them another chance for exposure because they're actually able to film them, video them, they can upload it to their sites and helps promote their, their music and what are their art forms they're, they're offering. Um, as far as the Parkland track, uh, they have $247,000 left to fundraise and through grant applications and donations in kind they're still confident this will be reached by year's end and that the work will begin in the spring of next year 2022 with completion in the fall of 2022 so it, it's uh, it's still looking really positive this is gonna gonna happen and finish in the timeline they're hoping um, uh, Blue Heron Park there will be trail maintenance removal of deadfall and invasive species in the next couple of weeks I'm assuming that's why they're, why they're providing, uh, but that is the plan. Um, they, they said to mention to people who use the, the trails regularly that they'll see an improvement. Um, and uh, also for to people to be aware that they will be staying at a capacity of 50 for in-person shows, which is the, the rules as of right now. Um, their plan is, and uh, Executive Director Brad Edgett was really firm on this, that they're going to stay uh, in this for a foreseeable future out of an abundance of caution even if the rules change a little bit just because they they just want to make sure that they're safe for everybody and everybody else comfortable using the facility so they're they're just going to use like this this he said an abundance of caution several times just to make sure that people know that they're they are looking out for the public and lastly the the AGM will be held on November 23rd at 4 p.m. for anybody that's interested and that's it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Garner. We'll next turn to uh, uh, sorry, committee reports. And we have, uh, I'll turn to Councillor Fallot, who is chair of our regular committee of the whole meeting on October 4th. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just before we move receipt, one small correction uh, under recommendation one in the minutes. It uh, is the vote was carried five two, and I believe staff have uh, corrected that. So uh, I will move receipt of the minutes for October fourth, twenty twenty one. A second moved and seconded. All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. And there was three recommendations that came out of that committee. Um, committee recommends, and I so move, for recommendation one, development permit application number DP100825, and development variance permit application number DV100310 at 2313 Orchard Avenue, which is to relax lot coverage, side yard setback for accessory buildings, and width of accessory buildings in order to construct two small lot single family dwellings. Recommendation that the development variance permit application DV100310 to relax the requirements for lot coverage, accessory building setbacks, and width of accessory buildings for the property at 2313 Orchard Avenue be denied. 
Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion? Councillor Duncan. Um, well, the applicant came and spoke to us today. Now, I was certainly one of the people who spoke about why we should deny it based on the fact that we're not actually building family homes and they misunderstood. What I mean is these aren't affordable. Of course, they've provided data to show that none, nothing in our town is even remotely in the ballpark of affordable for human beings. <laughs> I don't know who, who makes money like this. Um, and, and the feedback, I, I believe him entirely that people came through with their, you know, one or two kids and genuinely believe that a family cannot be raised in a house with less than two and a half bathrooms, which boggles my mind, having been raised as a family of four with one and a half bathrooms and one car out in a rural area. And somehow we all managed to live. I don't know. I became a counselor and everything. Um, but that, that the average person genuinely can't get around the idea that they can't live in a house like that. And I am kind of feeling um, maybe ornery about it, where I'm kind of like, no, you know what, I'm going to vote for this. Because if this is what people want, if this is the world people want, like if pe this is what people are asking for and they can't get it through their minds, why everything is unaffordable and why nothing works and why everything's too crowded and they can't find parking, I will let the people have what they want. And um, yeah, I'm going to vote for it now. <laughs> just, just to be contrary, because I don't know what else to do. And I don't know how, at this point, even denying this one, we'll do what we need it to do um, without having, having just re-examined the entire fundamental assumption of being able to subdivide lots and therefore increase the value of them in any way will ever create affordable housing. And perhaps penalizing one one developer for basically doing the same thing that decades has, of work has gotten us into this position is just not going to matter anyway. So yeah, I'm going to flip my vote on it. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor Wainwright, Councillor O'Keefe, and Councillor Rintoul. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to be voting in support of uh, denying the development permit, uh, the, sorry, development variance permit. I don't have any issue really with the accessory building setbacks or the width of the accessory buildings. It's the overall lot coverage. And, um, like, I guess, uh, I know we've granted quite a lot of, um, variances to lot coverage in the past in this general area, but if we uh, if the lot is subdivided and there are two uh, dwellings built that conform to the lot coverage we're still getting more housing than was there before and if the lot coverage is bigger we're still getting the same amount of housing more than was there before so the variance is not creating more housing for us. What it's doing is creating more lot coverage. And then it comes down to a question of do you really believe that um, a, a house with that kind of lot coverage, obviously a smaller square footage, is not going to serve Sydney. And um, I, I have to say I believe that a house that fits um, the lot coverage without variances will serve Sydney. Uh, I'm familiar with quite a lot of ones like that in Sydney, and um, people are snapping them up when they come on the market, and that's why there are only three houses currently on the market in Sydney. The other ones have already sold. Um, but I, I guess the thing is, at the end, it comes down to, for me, the question got asked last time, what benefit is there to the town of uh, approving this development variance permit? And normally, one of the things you do is you look at, is there a hardship for the, for the property owner? And I don't see it in this case. And the other thing you do is you look at, is Sydney getting something out of it? Like, does the town benefit? And I have to say, I don't see it in this case. So those two things make me look at this hard and say, well, I don't see a rationale for giving the variance. Um, and my colleagues did talk me into that at the last meeting. So thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Wainwright. I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. So I'm I'm still in favor of of letting letting this one go. Um, the door is open. Um, you know, if they want to come back at, at at some point and propose something different. So in terms of the, you know, talking about just giving people what they want, um, it's it to me. I think our role is balancing. Um, Kind of the need for housing and with other factors like quality of life and that's why we have these guidelines in terms of a of, of footprint and um, you know wanting to, to to make sure that we're not just building um, a bunch of little co concrete uh, jungles out there um, you know and it might feel like what's the point and at some point it's tempting to just okay, well, just forget it. What's, what's the use of sticking to our guns on this? But I think unless we start saying no to some of these things, th then nothing, nothing will change for sure. Um, I know in speaking with uh, people, I, you know, my brother's a, a developer in Vancouver, and, you know, he's told me they will continue doing whatever they can do. He said, you know, when municipalities start saying, no, you can't do this. He says, there's always a way around it. He said, but so if, if they force us to do something, if we have to do things different, they'll, they'll do it. So I think it's important for us to, to kind of be taking a stand on these things, to send a, a message to, to, in terms of what we want um, built in our community. And also, as Councillor um, uh, Wainwright says, um, we're, Where's the benefit to, to the community? Yeah, we're going to get two houses, but we could get we could still get that. They might be smaller houses. They might have one and a half bathrooms. Um, they might have smaller rooms, but I think there's still there's still an opportunity there. So I'm I'm fine to um, you know to let this one go. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Antool. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I was uh, certainly concerned uh, previously that that you know council were not going to see this referred to the advisory planning commission and that we've got a, a process that we would normally uh, follow and and look for the input from that you know group of uh, residents who uh, who have some expertise in this area and have seen a lot of these applications to to hear their uh, comments uh, on this application so I, I won't support the motion and I'll also note that I appreciate Mr. Gregory being here and, and talking about uh, you know being uh, open-minded to some revisions to address some of the concerns that uh, council brought up and I'm sure the same would come from Advisory Planning Commission comments look we've seen projects come before council come before APC and we've seen um, developers make changes uh, based on constructive feedback from both the APC and, and in council and, and I'm led to believe from the presentation this evening that we could expect the same uh, from uh, you know a Sydney business owner who lives in our community and is looking to move forward with this project I think you know in in a in a manner in which uh, they felt uh, they were providing a need to the community and so you know I see that my preference is to still see this go to APC for their uh, for their input and, and comment and so for that reason I won't support their motion Thank you, Councillor. I'll, uh, I'll speak next, and um, I won't support the motion for the reasons um, uh, Councillor Rintoul just gave. However, I share the rationale uh, from, from Council Wainwright uh, expressed with regards to lot coverage, and I, um, but I think in terms of process, we have appointed citizen representatives to an advisory planning commission and I think it's prudent that we uh, seek the input from that uh, from that committee and while I may have shared the same concerns as Council Wainwright and as we spoke to at last meeting I still feel we could benefit from uh, it being referred uh, to that body so I won't uh, support the motion Uh, seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? The three opposed, Councillor Duncan, Councillor Rintoul, and myself, the motion carries. 
Thank you. Fallon, can and uh, committee had a second recommendation, and I so move the CRD performing arts facility services recommendation that the report regarding CRD's bylaw to establish a performing arts facility service be received for information. Second. Uh, discussion. Seeing none. All in favor. None opposed. Motion carries. And the third and final recommendation from the committee, and I so move, is the initiative for 100% participation in CRD arts function recommendation that the report regarding CRD's initiative for 100% participation in the CRD arts function be received for information. Second. Moved and seconded. No discussion. All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Fowler. I'll turn to Councillor Rintoul regarding our, the Advisory Planning Commission meeting of October 5th. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move the minutes be received. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, Councillor Rintoul? I'll just take the opportunity to uh, uh, thank the Advisory Planning Commission. Uh, they met on two separate occasions to review um, the, uh, the key initiatives as identified uh, in the OCP report, uh, and I think had a very comprehensive discussions uh, around uh, the OCP and including some uh, input that's included within the minutes of the meeting and so uh, my thanks to them and, and uh, uh, look forward to uh, moving their recommendation. Thank you Councillor. Seeing no further discussion, all in favour? None opposed, motion carries. Uh, I'll move that the key points from the Advisory Planning Commission's meeting of October 5th, 2021, respecting the OCP Key Directions Report be received and referred to the OCP Review Advisory Committee for consideration. Second. Second. We have it moved and seconded. Discussion, Councillor Rintoul. Yeah, thank you. And, and that motion differs slightly from uh, what is in the report, um, simply uh, in that I know it was the APC's expectation that council would have the opportunity to review their, their comments, certainly, uh, but also that it be referred to the OCP Review Advisory Committee um, in that that is the next step in this process. And I expect that you know, council would see any consolidated recommendations from that group um, back before us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion? I just want to uh, also thank uh, APC for uh, considering these um, policy directions over two meetings and bringing forward the recommendations that will continue through our process. All those in favour? None opposed. Motion carries. We'll next move to staff report, the staff reports. And the first, item 13A, is a proposed approach to the Climate Action Plan. And um, I would turn to staff for an introduction, please. Good evening, Mr. Newcomb. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this report details a proposed approach to updating the town's uh, climate action plan. And as council knows, um, our original current climate action plan was adopted in 2010. Um, at this point, many of the actions uh, and initiatives in the climate action plan have either been completed or are sort of ongoing actions um, that the town continues to take on. Um, so it's it's a very timely uh, moment to update the plan and uh, incorporate some uh, some new initiatives into it. Um, and this is coming on the heels of some direction from council to move forward on the climate action file uh, with the 2019 uh, climate climate emergency declaration. Uh, and the 2020 creation of the Climate Action Coordinator position. So we did hire for that uh, position. Ms. Gil Mayer has been in uh, the position for about six months now. She is doing some fantastic work and uh, updating this plan is one of the main items on the work plan that we've developed for her. Uh, so we're excited to get started on that. We've done a few initial steps already um, and the uh, report outlines sort of a, a general uh, approach moving forward um, unlike sort of an OCP where there's a lot of community engagement, things like that, a climate action plan is much more of a technical document. So there's uh, quite a bit of number crunching and looking at initiatives that are sort of more on the technical side, things like solar panels and, and, uh, and the like. Um, but we did think it would be a good idea to bring this uh, approach forward for council's review and we're happy to take any comments you might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newcomb. I'll turn to council if they have any questions. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe, then Councillor Henry. 
co comments as well, or just questions? No, you, should hold, you can hold comments to uh, deliberation okay. on the resolution, okay. on the motion. Council Wainwright. Thank you, Mary. Uh, through you to staff, um, I appreciate the report, and the one thing that I'm um, that isn't crystal clear to me out of the report, you've got a section on what is the climate action plan, and you talk about some of the things that that would be in there. Um, I'm wondering how um, the vision that's uh, that staff has for the climate action plan compares with the scope of the document that um, Central Saanich recently did. Um, they've had a climate action plan update in 2020, you know, fairly recently, and um, that looks um, pretty broad in scope. So I, I guess the question, are we doing something comparably broad in scope, or is this more um, sort of focused on the initiatives that um, the corporation of the town of Sydney could implement? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so through the mayor to uh, Councillor Wainwright, um, yeah, I, I have to say I'm not intimately familiar with Central Sandwich's recent plan, but the idea is uh, to move beyond just the corporate stuff and, uh, and incorporate some community-oriented things in there as well. So it will be broader than just town's operations. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, seeing no questions from colleagues, I do have uh, one question through to staff, Mr. Humble or, or Mr. Newcomb, and I certainly appreciate the report. I appreciate it being presented in phases and different parts uh, within each of the phases. In phase two, it makes reference to um, uh, where staff begin developing climate action options and that um, it is during that phase, this phase that a community survey would be launched. And then in phase three, once the, uh, the draft plan is assembled, that at this stage, key elements of the plan will be brought back to the community for feedback. Um, and I would just ask staff if they would have any, any concerns or comment on um, a staff report coming to council prior to the community survey, so the council is aware of, of that process, and uh, also coming back, uh, another report coming back to council with the draft prior to going to uh, the community, that stage of community engagement. Do you want to speak to it, uh, Mr. Newcomb, or I can, uh, if you're comfortable yeah. with me responding? Please go ahead if you'd like to, Mr. Humble. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, actually, um, Mr. Newcomb and I uh, discussed uh, the, the, the feasibility of uh, providing council with uh, a staff report uh, prior to both of those uh, community engagement processes. And uh, from our perspective, yeah, uh, touching base with council uh, prior to those would be, uh, would be appropriate and uh, we could certainly uh, um, include that in the, uh, in the phased approach. Thank you, Mr. Humble. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Thanks. I lied. I did have a question. Um, so I, what I was wondering about is, so I'm just looking at phase one, and the third bullet talks about initial pop-up open house to inform community about update, and then phase two, the community survey. And so I guess I was wondering um, if in phase one we're just kind of doing background research. Um, I was just curious about what would we be informing the community about? Is it just that, hey, we're going to be doing this? Um, or whether we would just be better to, to wait until we actually go out in, in the survey? So I'm just wondering what the difference between those two things and what we were hoping to accomplish with, with the, that initial bit in phase one. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. And through the Mayor to Councillor O'Keefe, um, we won't be able to hold off on the uh, open house, sorry, it's not an open house, but a, a pop-up event. Uh, that actually happened on a Saturday at the, the last uh, market at the Mary Winspear Centre. And so Ms. Gilmer was out there um, really just chatting with the residents about uh, climate action in general, uh, not too specifically about the project, just sort of drumming up interest in climate action. Um, she spoke to about 50 people out there 
uh, just trying to get people aware of the project and climate action generally in the community. So that has happened. Um, as as Council is aware, we've also done quite a bit of engagement related to climate action through the OCP process. Um, most recently with the um, OCP tonight workbooks, they had a pretty extensive section on climate action. And, and so we do have a good amount of background information that we're going to be working with. And so the idea with the, the, the pop-up is just to, I think, bring some awareness to the community and, and keep the conversation going. And then with the community survey, I think we're more testing ideas out that might've come out of that OCP engagement or that you know we've sort of brainstormed and you know which direction might be a, a better one to go for Sydney. Um, so it's sort of moving that discussion along a little bit more uh, with the survey. So that's the idea there. Yeah, okay. And, and just one more uh, small thing, but just in terms of timeline, I'm presuming that when we say a report or uh, this will be developed by spring 2021, or we're meaning spring 2022, I, I presume? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. That's yeah. definitely 2022. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. Seeing no further discussion, we do have a recommendation. Move the report we received for information. Second. All in favor? Oh, sorry, Councillor O'Keefe. Discussion, no, Councillor O'Keefe. Sorry, no, just one, one, one comment, and it was just um, actually to reinforce your comment about. Um, I, I thought it was a good idea to have um, some council input at the end of I think it was phase one and, and before going out to um, the, uh, the the public for the community survey. So just reinforcing that. Thank you. I'll have a motion arising after this motion. Oh, okay. Thank you, Councillor. All in favor? None opposed, motion carries. So I would like to move a, a motion arising uh, that uh, staff bring a report uh, to council uh, prior to uh, the community survey being launched and bring a report to council uh, with the draft plan uh, prior to uh, community feedback. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? None opposed, motion carries. Thank you, thank you again, Mr. Newcomb. And next we'll move, turn to item 13B, which is the establishment of a climate action reserve fund. And I'll turn to staff for an introduction, please. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this is a, a staff report detailing the establishment of the climate action reserve fund. And it's uh, quite simply put, actually, um, the policy would outline the establishment of a transfer to a climate action reserve uh, annually to, uh, to assist in the carrying out of climate action related projects and the the pr proposed amount right now for that transfer is fifty thousand dollars per year and the second part of the policy is to provide some parameters around how that money might be spent on climate action initiatives so looking at you know what's the sort of bang for the buck in terms of ghg emissions reductions and um and providing the sort of sort of the best value for that money in achieving the town's objectives in the uh, climate action plan and so uh, it's it's quite a timely uh policy with the climate action plan uh, coming forward in the next six months or so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb. Uh, any questions for Mr. Newcomb? Uh, Councilor Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, we've called this climate action reserve, but when you look at the, um, the uh, criteria and the you know project prioritization criteria, it's all about greenhouse gas re uh, emission reductions. Whereas climate action can also be adaptation to sea level rise and all sorts of other things. I don't have any objection to it um, dealing with uh, greenhouse gas reduction initially, but um, we are going to have to put aside a fair amount of money to deal with the adaptation side of things. Probably more because it's capital projects. Um, so at some point, uh, we'll have to tweak the um, terms of reference for this reserve. Thank you, Councillor Wainwright. Uh, did staff wish to comment? Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Newcomb. Oh, thank you. Uh, ju just to say that I think um, going forward, I think staff are looking at the, the climate action field fairly holistically uh, with both mitigation and adaption measures. And so quite beyond just this policy, you know, I think when engineering undertakes a project, 
you know, climate action would be part of the considerations for that project. So, you know, if there's shoreline enhancement, climate, ac uh, climate action, mitigation, and adaption measures would something be something that gets taken into account. So hopefully some of those um, capital projects would be sort of integrated into the town's regular operations as well and not be sort of a, a separate, they might be a separate issue as well, but hopefully a lot of it would be uh, encompassed in our regular operations and, and considered through the typical uh, capital planning process. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb. Seeing no further discussion, or sorry, those were questions of staff. We have a recommendation. I'll move the recommendation that Council approve the Climate Action Reserve Fund policy to dedicate annual funding towards climate action projects and refer the decision around the level of annual funding to the upcoming budget process. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. We'll turn to item 13C, which is potential changes to parking lot F that is at 3rd and Bevan. And I'll turn to staff for an introduction, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, um, the impetus for this report is the, the change that was made last year with respect to um, parking lot F, which is owned by School District 63, and uh, it is now being leased by the town on a five-year term. And as of um, later next year, we're going to begin making monthly lease payments. So when we uh, made that change last year, Council asked that um, options be brought forward for increasing monthly parking revenues to potentially offset some of the cost that's coming our way. So this report is um, essentially an opening for Council to have some discussions on which of the proposed or perhaps other changes to um, parking enforcement and revenues that Council may want to see. What's currently being um, recommended here is to um, treat a portion of parking lot F uh, similar to the way lot A is treated, so more in terms of um, a long-term parking lot. And in conjunction with that, we are recommending that the monthly uh, parking pass fees, which haven't been raised for 10 years, also be increased uh, in the near term. If Council has any questions about the report, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hissick. I'll turn to colleagues if there are any questions. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thanks. And just cu uh, curious in terms of, um, they've mentioned about th the maximum number of monthly permits that can be issued for that lot is 20. I'm just wondering, is there um, a policy on how we determine how many permits will be monthly permits will be um, offered in a certain lot or is it just um, by demand? I'm just wondering how that gets determined. Um, through the Mayor to Councillor O'Keefe, the, the maximum of 20 per lot was set um, the last time that Council raised the fees, so roughly 10 years ago. And uh, it was set at a maximum of 20 regardless of the parking spaces in that particular lot. So that is uh, another aspect that may be tweaked if we're looking at uh, changes. A f a follow up, if I may. Um, so, and I'm just wondering, is there one policy or, or document somewhere that that speaks to all of the different lots and um, how many are dedicated for long-term use, um, what the amounts are, when the increases should be, or is it, I guess I'm, I'm looking, is there one place where all of this information is uh, kind of pulled together? Or, or do we just look at each lot sort of um, separately? Um, unfortunately, there is no one document that can be referred to. We, we largely follow the, uh, the parking and loading bylaw with respect to what's permitted at the lots, but beyond that, it's periodic discussions like these when we make changes to um, the price of the lots as well as potentially some of the other governing aspects. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. 
Further discussion? So we have um, options. Uh, sorry, Councillor Fallon. Thank you. Um, just to follow up um, through you to staff, if I may, the comment that uh, the, f the monthly passes were last increased in 2011 is um, do we need to put something in place as well that the, uh, the fees are looked at on a regular basis, uh, more frequent regular basis than 10 years? Because playing catch up is always difficult and we're always gonna be behind the eight ball, but I think there needs to be something in place that we are looking at this on a regular basis. If that is council's wish, then certainly that could be built into uh to our practices. Um, however, it is brought forward periodically for um, comment through various considerations related to parking. And uh, last time it was brought forward, I don't believe any changes were uh, recommended. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hissick. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fellett. Uh, Councillor Rintoul. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll confess I, I, I struggled reading this report um, and took a couple of cracks at it and still don't know that uh, I've done justice to it and maybe lost some hair in the process um, with that uh, how urgent is this in in the minds of staff that we uh, move forward particularly with the first recommendation and I say that because um, I can't help but think seeing some more commonality uh, for the parking lots might be um, easier to understand uh, for uh, parking lot users uh, for enforcement purposes, etc. And so I'm just wondering if, um, uh, if in the opinion of staff, you know, we really need to move forward with this first recommendation, or if it was the council motion that is originally the, the sort of driving factor here. Uh, through the chair, it is in fact the council motion that this be brought back well in advance of uh, us having to pay. So we, we've got um, close to a year before that happens, so um, there is time. However, if council does wish to make changes to the way we govern our parking lots, there's no time like the near future. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And if, if I may, I, I'll just acknowledge I'm, I'm comfortable with the uh, second recommendation because I, I feel like uh, that is more reflective of, of a market uh, price that we're seeing in, in Sydney for uh, parking passes uh, through other means. And so uh, I'll leave my, my comments there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wainwright? <coughs> thank you, Mayor. Uh, I agree with my colleague about the... Uh, the second recommendation, I think that is one that you know we can deal with tonight. Um, I'm not comfortable with the uh, uh, with a suggestion of increasing the um, the amount of monthly paid parking, uh, generally overall, or you know in any particular parking lot. Um, we built the employee parking lot to. Uh, reduce the need for long-term parking um, and it's free um, so it I, I would prefer to see the the majority of the spaces in the town's parking lots um, that are throughout the downtown be temporary parking to provide that kind of turnover for um, customers and shopping in the downtown and such it's obviously got to be a long enough stay to be practical for those people, but um, a three-hour stay seems pretty good for that uh, to me. And uh, and having the, the having a larger percentage of them turn into monthly parking is just going to exacerbate that. Um, so I I would not want to I, I wouldn't support either of uh, of the options that. Um, that move in that direction. I, I do think we need to have a fuller discussion of it. And I, I would suggest that Committee of the Whole is the right uh, form for that kind of thing. And tonight, I think we should just increase the monthly fee um, effective January 1st and then have the discussion uh, some other time. 
Uh, thank you, Councilor Wainwright, and, and I'll go Councilor O'Keefe, and then I would like to speak. Uh, th thank you. Just uh, one more question for staff. Um, thinking about the, uh, the the parking lot that uh, the town invested, at Mary Winsbury. Do we um, do we get any information or have any data from them about how well used those spots are? Um, uh, that's one question, and the other one is, do we have the uh, the, the the ability? to um, have monthly paid parking spaces at Mary Winspear, or is that a, uh, in sort of conflict with the uh, Memorial Park Society's uh, rules there, if, if you have that information? <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor. First of all, we don't keep um, formal records on the use of the employee parking lot, but okay. um, Every time you go by there, the, the lot that's closer to downtown, uh, that, that half is always nearly full. And seasonally, the, um, the other portion is also well used. So it has been very successful um, in terms of um, relieving some of the congestion at some of the other town lots, as well as um, in the neighborhood around Thrifties and, and Savon. Uh, with respect to the question about monthly parking at that lot, um, the fact that you have all day parking with no time restriction, it kind of supersedes the need to sell monthly parking there because the whole purpose of the parking passes is to allow greater than three hours at a time. So we're not really looking at that. Yeah, okay. Yep, and I, I guess my, <coughs> my overall comment, um, agree with my my colleagues in terms of um, uh, deferring this for now I, I think since we had this discussion um, we're seeing increased pressure in the downtown area and I think that's gonna continue to increase as you know those two pubs open up and that condos get filled down here so I'd be interested in uh, rather than looking at you know just lot F to let's look at the whole ball of wax in terms of what's going on with, with all of those parking spaces? How many do we have? Um, what do we think is an appropriate percentage to rent out for, for monthly? I, I don't think there should be very many, but maybe some. Um, and um, look at sort of what are some of our other, other needs in terms of um, long-term long parking, um, overnight parking perhaps. So I, I'm sort of leaning towards putting this off for now and having staff come back with a, 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 a broader sort of approach on how we might uh, address downtown parking. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. I'm sorry, did I insert myself as a speaker after yourself? Yes, yes thank you. And then I'll turn to Councillor Garnett. Um, I um, found myself reading this report asking my some, myself some questions about the other parking lots. And so we know we have parking lot A, B, D, E, and F, and then we have the small parking, the town parking uh, allotment in the Pier Hotel, and then of course we have the very large uh, parking lot at uh, the Mary Winspear Center. And um, while there's some common characteristics with uh, four out of the five uh, town lots, uh, there are differences with Lot A, and uh, certainly with the Mary Winspear Center. And um, I would find it helpful if, if uh, we referred uh, this discussion to a committee of the whole meeting in November. Uh, and staff may bring some additional information on uh, the parameters of those other parking lots uh, uh, to that meeting. Having said that, um, I, um, there were two recommendations, and we haven't had a recommendation put forward yet, um, but I would, um, uh, there were three matters that uh, were addressed in the report, two recommendations, um, and that uh, if council did want to bring forward a motion with regards to increasing the monthly parking passes, um, uh, I think that would be appropriate to do tonight and uh, we could certainly have a discussion about uh, consistency or continuity amongst parking lots at that uh, committee of the whole meeting in November. And uh, with regards to uh, the other, uh, the other uh, recommendation with regards to long term paid, I'm not presently in support of it but I'd like to hear from my colleagues and I think uh, again the committee of the whole meeting would be a good venue to just have a discussion about that. So I would look if there would, if council wishes to make a motion with regards to the uh, parking pass increase. 
monthly parking pass increase. I'll move that the rate oh, for monthly. Sorry, sorry if I may interrupt, uh, Councillor Garnet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, question through the staff. Um, <clears throat> you said we have about a year, uh, and I'm, I'm having read your report. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to huh, trying to think outside the box in terms of how we would come up with those resources to pay that yearly fee for that parking lot outside of doing something. I know it's part of the overall discussion you want to have, but are there other, other than what you've looked at here, are there other ways that we could find those resources? Um, well, in the absence of any revenue increases, it'll just be funded through general taxation. Um, if you wanted to challenge us to earmark some other revenue source for this, we could give it some thought, but nothing comes to mind immediately. One would think parking revenues to cover parking fees is generally how we approach it. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm just prior to that motion, just that since everybody's providing comments, I just, I just found it interesting, interesting here, the, 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 the paragraph where it says construction of additional downtown residences, staff and experiencing a demand for monthly parking. And I can't help but think that this is all tied into pay and lieu that happened previously and this is just something we have to keep in mind when we have that discussion and um, also having talked to staff I, I was uh, really appreciative of the fact that if we do take that route that the uh, accessible parking spaces would remain to be free for up to three hours for those people using the spots so thank you mr. mayor uh, thank you councillor uh, Councillor Rintoul. I'll move the recommendation that the rate for monthly parking passes be increased from $40 to $50 effective January 1, 2022. Second. Further discussion? I'll call a question. All in favour? None opposed. Motion carries. And I would make a motion to refer uh, discussion on our uh, town parking lots to a committee of the whole meeting in November. Second. Uh, Councillor Rintoul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think from this discussion, um, you know, I, I would not want to see this just come back on the agenda without a little more for insight from staff, of course. And I think from this discussion, there's probably some um, direction uh, for staff on that. Uh, Councillor Garnett's, uh, you know, question around, uh, you know, how do we pay for this? You know, one of the items perhaps staff could consider, uh, you know, in this report is that issue of overnight parking uh, we've got empty parking lots uh, at night uh, whether or not we sell limited time uh, parking uh, overnight in some of these empty parking lots given that as was pointed out we've got uh, a lot of residents uh, likely struggling uh, to find parking or parking in those lots at night at any rate uh, and so uh, I would encourage staff to at least uh, enter into some uh, some thought with regard to that in this uh, report for council or committee of the holes discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I really like the idea of overnight parking. I, th I think that's great. It's a way to make use of that space and get some revenue. Um, some other things, I guess, what I'd like to see uh, come back is um, maybe I'm I'm hoping that we can come up with uh, maybe that one document that that I talked about one one document or policy that covers here's how we operate in with in terms of our um, our downtown parking spaces th those parking lots so coming up with a cap on how many are going to be for long term use um, if there's going to be monthly rates um, that those are going to be reviewed annually or biannually um, that sort of thing. Um, I also wouldn't mind tossing in there, um, looking at how many accessible parking spaces that are in in those lots and and around town. And yeah, I know that you know in the that's kind of kind of related, I guess, to the off street uh, uh, parking bylaw. But in terms of the numbers, whether there's opportunity to to increase that, um, what else? monthly passes, yeah, overnight parking. Um, yeah, and, and also being able to have some 24, 24 hour, or maybe 48 hour spots to accommodate, um, 
You know that traffic that goes out to Sydney Spit? A lot of people come in here, look for a place to park their car, and while they go to Sydney Spit for, for a night of camping or something. So trying to pull all those different elements maybe together into one document would be, um, would be nice. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. I turn to Mr. Humble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can I make a suggestion? I'm um, he hearing everything that uh, is being discussed tonight is very helpful, and, uh, and staff will certainly do their best to bring a, um, a detailed staff report back to uh, or to a future community of the whole uh, that covers everything and uh, is comprehensive in scope. Um, if I can, I'd just, just respectfully like to make a suggestion rather than putting a, a deadline of November if we could maybe just indicate as soon as as soon as practical that staff have that together um, whether it's november or or perhaps at a early committee of the whole in december or even in the early new year we want to do the report justice and uh, and make sure that we're covering all the detailed information for uh, for council thank you mr humble as the mover i will uh, i will move to amend it to a future uh, committee of the whole meeting second I'll take that as a friendly amendment of Council. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Next, we'll turn to item 13D, which is um, the Royal Canadian Legion and the Remembrance Day 2021 event. And uh, we have a recommendation. I'll move the staff recommendation that. The, for the closure of Sydney Avenue between 3rd and 4th Street, with 3rd and 4th Street remaining open, be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the Legion obtain approval from the RCMP to ensure traffic control is, a, is approved and in place to their satisfaction. Two, that the Legion conform to all town bylaws. Three, that the Legion arrange a meeting with town staff, the RCMP, and the Sydney Fire Department to review safety requirements at least four weeks prior to the event. And four, that the Legion send out notices at least two weeks prior to the event to affected residents and businesses advising of the event and provide a contact number should there be any concerns or questions. And five, that the Legion follow current provincial health order guidelines and communicate mitigation measures to attendees. Second. Uh, moved and seconded. Any discussion? I'll call the question. All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. We have no items under Section 14 correspondence, but we have three items under uh, Section 15 correspondence for information. Move for receipt. Second. All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we have no notices of motion or motion to go in camera. I'd look for a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. And second. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Good evening.